I'm Stephen Harris, the publisher of the Wealth Briefing Group of Newswires, and today I'm hosting a roundtable to discuss the ultra-high net worth segment in wealth management. Around the table, I have Irene Graham from the British Bankers Association, Wendy Spires, a consultant in PR from Bulletin PR. We have Remy Frank from French banking giant BNP Paribas Wealth Management, Caroline Garnham from networking site Family Beehive, William Drake from private investment office Lord North Street, and Dan Dagg from EY. Thank you all very much for joining me today. So, we hear from our friends at Wealth Monitor that the ultra high net worth segment has grown by 140% between 2012 and 2013. Caroline, does that meet with your view? Have you seen a huge increase in the ultra high net worth segment from your site? Yes, I think the ultra high net worth segment is growing, is growing globally. Um, I think that they are becoming more demanding. Uh, they certainly want to build a, a team of trusted advisors, um, and the second generation is, is coming, coming through uh, strongly, um, and they want to get involved in, in some cases. So yes, we are. Remy, have you seen geographical changes? What's happening with BNP Paribas Wealth Management? Is it an, an Asian growth for you? Yes, absolutely. For, for BNP Paribas, the, the main growth in ultra-high net worth uh, this year has come from Asia. It's not a surprise. It's the case for many other banks. Uh, but I, I would also uh, mention uh, what we were doing in the uh, CIS, uh, Russia and all those countries in Middle East. And to a lesser extent, we still see some growth even uh, in countries like France, Belgium, or Italy, where the, the growth, the economic growth, is not there, but you still can find some entrepreneur who is making their way and uh, getting to the ultra-high segment. William, what are you saying? Well, our client base is really continental European uh, mainly, but we have been seeing some interest from Mexico and other Latin American countries in the last year or so. So what are your Mexican <coughs> clients like? They tend to be uh, extremely wealthy owners of private businesses, um, probably founded by a grandfather who's in his 80s. Um, and the family is very wealthy. Probably after the grandfather d passes on, uh, they may float or sell, and suddenly a huge liquidity, absolutely huge liquidity event might, might occur. So they're also positioning themselves from a governance point of view, very, very heavy uh, questioning on governance and, ha and how we handle the wealth once we have it is really the, the lead service that they require at the moment rather than handling actually asset management. So, Dan, do you see various uh, business models being more relevant to the ultra-high net worth uh, segment or, or is, 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 it, uh, is it very much according to the individual? Well, I think when, when thinking about that, I'll, I'll just wind back to one of the things that you said earlier around the growth that you've seen between 12 and 14. But that <clears throat> underpinning that, there's a bit of a different story by geography. We've seen that uh, in, in Asia, through the uh, financial crisis, there was actually a decline in the ultra-high net worth segment, and it's only just picking back up. So we have seen massive growth in the last uh, few couple of years in Asia, but prior to that, it was as a result of a, a bit of a downturn in that, in that market. So going to the point you made around, uh, do we see different models as a result of that? Well, <clears throat> I think you see uh, certainly different attitudes to the way people are investing in terms of, uh, you know, th there's a much more uh, comprehensive view on uh, risk within people's strategies and, and, and attitude. And therefore, what they're looking for very much, or what we see them looking for, is the quality of the relationship and their advisors and staying very close to the advisors. So certainly, the family office model is very strong in the ultra-high net worth space. So in terms of personality types, can one personality type be uh, said to uh, categorise uh, ultra-high net worth, or are they all as different as, as, as we are? Who has a view on that? I certainly do. Go on. Um, I think that the, uh, the ultra-high net worth uh, are not a category, they're people. Right. Um, they're people who have money, right. and they're as different as the people that you know and you can come across. Um, but they are... They, they are unique in the sense that they all have money that they either have to look after or they can spend or they can give it away. Uh, that's the only thing that distinguishes them. But apart from that, they're all different and they're all people. 
So there's no personality type that, uh, that is more likely to make money rather than another. Huh. Well, <laughs> well in, my, in my experience, very successful uh, businessmen tend to be, particularly start-up businessmen, entrepreneurs, tend to be very detail-minded, very controlling, yes. very determined, and willing to take uh, setbacks in their stride. Um, and that can mean that when they sell their business, it's terrible generalization, that when they sell their business, they, they can be, their attitude to investing can be equally uh, control, controlling. They want to decide everything. They want to monitor everything uh, every second of the day because that's how they built the success of their business. I mean, there are great exceptions to that, but... Um, I, I would say as a Remy, general, your, your clients you similar, similar to that? Do you yes, in fact, uh, we have clients from every generation because we are more than 100 years old uh, in the bank. Uh, we have clients in emerging markets who are very young. Uh, some are much elder in uh, uh, some uh, Western countries in Europe, for instance. But uh, I feel that they all want first uh, to keep the money and to give it than to their heels. That's the first motivation for all the clients. And whether you are talking to a young entrepreneur in China or Russia who is 35 years old and whose kids are only one or two, or to an elder man or woman uh, in Europe or in Hong Kong, because in Hong Kong it's already the third generation, first motivation is I don't want to lose money because I want to transmit it to my family afterwards. Then we speak about performances, allocation, etc. But never forget that they first want to keep it and give it to their family. Although, if I might interject, there are exceptions to that. We have clients that don't want to give it to their children, that they, they want to give it away. All and, of it? Uh, all of it. Really? Yeah. Uh, and it's not, it's not, I mean, that's very unusual. Sure. But, you know, again, it's so difficult to generalize about, about these things. Does that cause problems? Oh, awful, awful problems. Awful problems. Awful problems. Terrible, awful problems. But wealth does create awful problems. Yeah. Whether you, whether it's a magnifying glass. Whether, you give it, whether you're going to give it to them or not give it to them, you've already caused the problem by making it. Yeah, absolutely right. Do you think they regret making it, though? No. 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 <laughs> no. I think it means that they share certain concerns. Like it's very dangerous to draw any kind of generalisation, but I think you can nail down certain common issues. Um, if a family has made wealth, I'm sure they're very cognizant of the fact that for every Rockefeller you have a Vanderbilt, and that there is this um, you know, phrase from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, and it, it does happen all the time. And so preserving that wealth and having something to show for generations upon generations is probably something that most of them would want, um, even if that's a philanthropic mission as opposed to a, a family mission. So, Irene, do your, do your members at the BBA have a focus on the ultra-high net worth segment? Well, Absolutely, and they have a focus on, on private wealth management as well across sure. the spectrum, but it's a very big focus, and the, the UK is a large centre for private banking uh, for high net worth individuals and the ultra high net worth individuals, and always, I mean, in that environment today, everybody's looking to make sure they can absolutely service the client and the client needs, which I agree is very specific for the individual client, against the regulatory framework as well that is necessary to um, make sure that it's um, in controlled uh, environment. And that is you know, some of the challenge of the regulatory framework and also what high net worth and ultra high net worth individuals are looking to achieve. I'm quite interested as well in terms of the investment aspect and your points about what our ultra high net worth is looking to do with their wealth in terms of angel investment and how much you're seeing and whether you're seeing an increase in investing in other entrepreneurs or other smaller businesses if you're actually seeing angel investment which is growing in this marketplace mm. and indeed yeah. in Europe whether there's a trend in the wealth managers around this yeah. table yeah. in terms of that being an asset class. I mean I'm certainly at. seeing a lot of uh, a great trend towards wanting to co-invest mm. and as you mentioned the regulatory mm. system there's a lot of frustration mm. amongst these these ultra high net worths who want to co-invest that they can't find the investments of other single family offices because they can't promote it because the FCA actually prohibits the promotion of these, these co-investment deals. So they're scurrying around trying to find somebody else 
who they can get to know and who they can and, co-invest with. And so in the banking with. industry and in the private wealth managers are looking with the FCA at how can we make sure we can continue to service the needs of the ultra high net worth. Yeah. I, I do hope we will get, uh, and we are making progress on various aspects of that because it's really critical that we are able to match what the client need is to what the opportunities are. And, and we're working very hard on that. On that theme, I think you have to bear in mind that in the the everyday investor space, um, the crowdfunding scene is really taking off. There are sites like Cedars and and all of their um, peers that allow the everyday investor to to angel invest, albeit on a very small scale. And so I think it would be a real shame if the ultra high net worth were missing out on those kinds of of opportunities economically for the UK and and for each individual country as well as for the actual investor themselves. So Remy, is this the kind of thing that BNP Paribas helps with? Your, yes, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, we have a great uh, variety of clients uh, because we, we are present in uh, uh, more than 100 countries for the bank and uh, 30 countries for wealth management. So we have clients everywhere. And uh, uh, what we do is that uh, we have some uh, uh, particular investments that we open only for ultra high net worth individuals. So in the end, they end up to be between peers. But uh, one is coming maybe from Taiwan, the other one from Russia, the other one from Middle East, and the last one from Brazil. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we are also coping with this regulation, so, so we, 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 we have to be very careful in doing this. Uh, but uh, we have some co-investment where even the bank is putting its own money. Uh, we have also some examples in real estate, because we are a very big broker in real estate in continental Europe. So uh, we, we happen to do it. And last but not least, we have our corporate finance team, which is uh, originating some uh, businesses which are on sale or where some families are looking for other families. And then we are uh, intermediated by corporate finance, so it's no problem to, to do it and with our clients. Right, Remy. I think all of the private banks are looking at how they continue to, to support because they want to support the ultra high net worth, and there are opportunities to do that within that regulatory exactly. framework. So, I agree. If, if, if I could just sound a note of warning on this, um, it, it seems to, when you go to family office conferences and say, it, it's, it sounds as though all this co investing is going to be a success. I personally think it won't be. Because I think very few families have the resources to really do it properly. And when you think how many mistakes the best people in the business make in private equity, particularly early stage private equity, how many deals go wrong, how much effort it takes to sort them out, this seems to have been completely forgotten. And it's assumed that co-investment is by its nature a good thing and mm. private equity is a good thing. And I think that... Um, most people will make a, a complete failure of it, yeah. and well, and then and then <coughs> uh, time will uh, time will pass, and they'll realise that if they want to do private equity, they need to do it uh, through professional advisors. The thing that I've found with uh, co-investment with family offices is that the family offices that have uh, expertise with their with their family office with analysts, etc., they all want to put their analysts onto a particular project. They've all got different agendas, and it's very much like herding cats. So although a lot of them want to co-invest, when it actually gets down to the nitty-gritty, they're finding it very difficult to marry up the agenda, to find the, the key lead co-investor that the others will fall in with. And what we're finding is becoming more interesting is that the people who don't have the analysts but do want to invest, co-invest with another that's taking the lead that's more likely to be successful. But the ones that have got their own agendas, it's very, very difficult to get them yeah. put together. Do you find that a problem, Remy? No, because we, we are the federator of all those families. So, so usually uh, uh, we are uh, proposing investment. Of course, we ask the client themselves to do the due diligence and then they need the analyst. But at inception, we, we are, I would say, in the middle. Uh, and so we are not facing these type of, uh, of issues. You're syndicating the, the transactions, are you, is that right? Sort of, yes. <coughs> but sometimes we are in the transaction, sometimes we are not, so, so mm -hmm. it depends. And single family offices generally, do you, do you see them as being competitive to what you're doing or do you see them as being um, working with you in lots of ways? No, we, we, we don't see them at all as a competitor mm -hmm. because uh, uh, we are used to speak with many of them everywhere in the world. When we speak to the representative of the family office, 
we exactly treat the person as an institution because it's a professional who is managing a lot of money. So we give him the same treatment as we do for hedge funds or pension funds in the, in the investment banking side jointly with our investment bank. So this is the way we approach family offices, institutions. But we also always want to have also a relationship with the ultimate beneficial owner. So that's why we have also developed uh, some products or services uh, which are of a great interest of those persons. And, and let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, the first one is assisting them in philanthropy. Uh, uh, we know that most of the ultra high networks want to give back. Sometimes they need some help just to, to know to whom or should they set up their own foundation, etc. So here we give them an advice, a service. We have lots of experience for 10 years now. And in this case, you don't speak to the family office, you speak to the beneficial owner. Maybe another example is uh, uh, we have a very big activity in jet and yacht financing. And when you are speaking about jet and yachts, you are speaking to the beneficial owner because it's his or her baby, if mm. you will. So we give him also some advice because we know very well the, the manufacturer of jets and yachts and we want to, to know what we are financing. So it's a very interesting dialogue and this dialogue doesn't take place at the family office level. So, William, do you ever get involved in yacht financing and jet financing? These no, because these we don't offer lending services, but right. uh, we do have clients who come to us and ask us who they should go to. We can point them in the right direction for who they might go to for the finance or for the purchase of the yacht uh, or plane itself. And obviously we have to um, <clears throat> adjust the portfolio if the, if the client tells us they're going to buy a jet in a year's time or six months' time, we might get to buy the dollars or, and get ready for that. But no, we're not in the lending business. Can I just pick up something that you said, <coughs> William? You said that if you don't do the lending, but uh, if someone does want to have mm. that sort of service, you know someone that does. Increasingly, I'm finding with the ultra-high net worth, they want to be able to work with someone that they can trust, yeah. who's got a wide network so that they can refer, that they might not do it themselves, but they can refer them to someone yeah. who does. Yes, and we, we keep a, a, a database of suppliers of all kinds of services. We don't try and take it, make any money out of it. But if someone says, you know, I'm thinking of buying a grouse more or, or, or art, whatever, we, we obviously can point them in the right direction, but not as a money-making uh, operation. Right. Uh, just about what you say, we are a very big lender because we have a very big uh, balance sheet. And uh, when we lend to someone, some, sometimes we lend hundreds of millions of euro, pounds or, or dollars. We need to know very well the person. Uh, and in this case, uh, we don't want to speak to the advisor who knows us. Mm. We, we need to speak to the client him or herself. Mm. Uh, sometimes we have clients, I have in mind in Asia, who have very big uh, 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 block of shares, their own company, and they need cash to reinvest or to do anything. Uh, and that's what we call the monocounter financing. But in this case, it could be huge amounts. We really need to have the direct relationship with the client. <coughs> and that's where, for the credit, I think, uh, the relationship must be uh, uh, for the client with the bank directly without any intermediary. If not, we are not comfortable into lending to someone who knows someone else. Mm -hmm. I think you're very wise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> are you seeing that with your, with your members too, Irene? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think um, in all of those instances, um, your point about being able to point the client to the right source if it's not yourself directly, or indeed as BNP Paribas doing the direct service provision is, is a critical factor. And I do think, I do a lot actually with the marine industry here. Mm. And one of the things they will absolutely say, uh, and they run obviously the boat shows here, is the investment coming from overseas, ultra high net worth individuals into the purchasing of uh, yachts is, is quite a significant mm way in which that industry actually and where the buying is coming from is from overseas actually yeah. high net worth individuals and I'm quite interested actually just in 
in, in looking at the sort of inward flows of investment into the UK and what you're seeing from the external. We've talked about Brazil, we've talked about Asia, and just where the flows of funds are actually moving if you look at the ultra high net worth individuals. And are we worried about how we identify those people, how we make sure that they're bona fide, that they're not criminals, that the money is clean? <laughs> We hear so much about how much is being uh, spent on KYC. Do you think that's a problem specifically in the ultra-high net worth sector? Dan, what do you, what do you think about the, the whole compliance <coughs> arena? Well, we, we're obviously seeing uh, a lot of the uh, wealth managers and private banks that we're working with are spending a lot of time thinking about this and making sure that uh, uh, things are in place. So I think there is a possible feeling that um, uh, they, they have traditionally managed to know all their clients and they know them very well and everything else, but there is a definitely an element where they have to evidence it now in, in, in perhaps uh, in a more robust way than perhaps they did in the past. Not, not, not so much that they didn't uh, know the client and they didn't examine mm -hmm. where the funds were, but there's, there's, there's a burden of proof now that, that they have to maintain, uh, which, which I think for many ultra high net worth clients can seem... Um, can, can seem difficult and, and, and laborious to go through the process. But I think that clients are also understanding of, of why that is and the need for it, and, and it protects them as well. So, if I may, uh, in BNP Paribas, we, we have a chance because uh, we are also a very big uh, corporate bank. And so we know many entrepreneurs uh, from inception where they are not rich at all, when they are setting up their business. Mm. And we are starting with them. We accompany them in lending, usually, Typically, we are the biggest lender in the world in the energy and commodity sector, but also in many others. And so we know where the money comes from. Very often, we have seen the company growing, and we have quite strong synergies between the corporate department and wealth management. So, of course, we, we are trying to get the client to become afterwards when he or she becomes rich or introduce the company in the stock exchange to become our client. But we know very well the client for sometimes 20 years when he was not rich at all. So we can track where the money comes from. And that's a very big advantage because of course, for our compliance officers, when the client has been known for 20 years in the bank, it's much easier to prove it than when he comes just from the day before. And of course, that's one of the benefits of uh, organizations. You can provide more of a one-stop shop but a lot of clients uh, in the ultra high net worth space are diversifying and moving and moving their their wealth around other organisations, and mm. uh, that that can't always be achieved. Uh, be achieved. So they need to. Um, there is always going to be a burden where they're going to have to uh, evidence where the wealth has come from. But that's where um, you know it's important that, that the wealth manager and the private banker is able to um, to. to uh, build the relationship and the rapport with the client so that they can gather that information. Are a good way of money laundering. Absolutely. <laughs> um, because, you know, especially if you have the cash and you don't have, you don't have to borrow. Um, I don't know how strict yacht brokers are around the world about anti-money anti -money laundering uh, regulations. But how far back do you have to go in terms of where the, the money came from originally? Well, we all have to go right back to the, to the beginning of the money. Mm. But I, I don't know if a yacht broker around the world would do that. I, I, I just have no idea. But if you have to, if, or if you want to turn that yacht into cash, the bank who receives that cash has to go all the way back, I guess. Yeah, so yeah, I so. you're stuck, stuck with the yacht. Yeah. Yes. I was going to say, that's right. I mean, whatever the, the transaction ultimately goes between bank to bank, yeah. each of them has to know exactly where that flow of funds have come from. But, yeah, it, therefore... You need to be very clear about your knowledge base on that. Respect their ways around it. Absolutely. So, Wendy, do you have any any anecdotes, having spoken to ultra high net worth clients, about uh, the way that they feel that they're being treated by their banks or prospective banks? Um, I think what comes through very strongly is that, that it's very easy to make assumptions as to what kind of people ultra high net worth clients are. It's Obviously it behooves us as an industry to try to draw some kind of um, commonalities between uh, members of that segment. But um, I've heard of clients being, um, because they're, they're very unassuming people, being treated in a, in a less than key client manner, um, if you can term it in that way. So um, you know, one client in particular was a key client by, in terms of assets um, by anyone's standard, and yet um, was given a relatively junior manager um, who wasn't really on a, on a level footing. And 
luckily um, this gentleman is, um, is a very nice person and, and didn't really kick up a fuss about that, but I should imagine that many other clients might feel quite insulted by, by uh, that. I was, I've been in a room with uh, just over 15, 16 ultra high net worth and a round table discussion asking them what their attitude was towards their advisor and the word milked came out a lot. Um, they are really, really angry with product pushing. Uh, they feel that people aren't listening to them. Um, and this is across the whole sector, whether it's lawyers, accountants, wealth advisors, etc. They feel that there are now so many specialists that the specialist really can't think out of the box. And they've got, if it's a trust lawyer, it's going to be a trust-based solution. If it's a corporate lawyer, it's going to be a, a, a shareholders agreement. And if it's a probate lawyer, it's going to be a will. And whatever your area of specialization, people seem to be thinking of the solution in that way. And they feel that there is not enough reporting with regard to the fees. There is not enough of an upfront discussion about what it's going to charge, what they can expect, what's the reporting. And they feel that once they've got into the relationship, that they're drowning and they don't know how much it's going to cost. Uh, and that, that seems to be a huge uh, trend at the moment and they're fed up with it. Mm. It's surprising in a way when you, when you think these are very successful people who've built a business up, dealt with counterparties, negotiated with, with salespeople in their careers. It's, it's surprising they, they're surprised that people who provide services are going to try and make as much money as possible out of them. I, I, I think that it's because they've come out of their comfort zone. They've been making a product designing software, whatever, whatever it is, and suddenly they're in a new world. They don't understand yeah. the jargon. They yeah. don't understand where the bodies are buried. They yeah. don't know what's going to hit them. Do you think that it's also uh, down to the industry as a whole? We often say, you know, we know our clients very well. We think only about our clients. We've got our clients' best interests at heart. And then the client hears this and thinks, OK, well, you're not trying to make money out of me then, are you? Do you think, do you think that we, as an industry, need to, to have a more commercial approach with our, with our clients yes. from, from the word go yeah, and say, look, so this sorry, is... Sorry, the, the, the clients fully understand that uh, we are also there to make money. Yeah. They accept it as long as it's not outrageous. So, so I think, uh, first of all, the relationship is fair with the clients. They know that we are not a charity and that we have shareholders, so we have to, to make money. Uh, they know it very well. They understand it well. What they don't want is that we, we go above what they, they consider as normal. And we were talking about the regulators before. Uh, I must say that for the last five years, there have been tremendous progresses or obligation of transparency. Mm -hmm. So now all the clients know what the banks are making out of them. And then it's a fair and transparent <coughs> discussion with the client. They know how much you made. Would they feel it good enough, too much? That's a discussion, yeah. but at least uh, uh, now it's transparent in mm. nearly every jurisdiction, at least the jurisdiction where they want to be to have their money in. Yeah, I, mean, I think that, that a big drive in regulation mm. is transparency, and, and definitely the banks are responding to that very positively. I mean, also um, high net worth individuals, ultra high net worth individuals, wealth management private has traditionally in the banking sector been very relationship management focused. Uh, I'm not saying in every instance that may work for the individual client, but it has been a very much a core relationship management focus with, of course, the product specialist. But I do think that drive for regulatory transparency, that drive for the customer engagement is very much a focus both with regulators and the banking industry, and they're very supportive to that. I think... Oh, sorry. Uh, I was just going to pick up on the point that Caroline made there. I think she made a very good point about the fact that if you introduce a large number of professional advisors that these, com these ultra high net worth customers need, you know, they have quite complex affairs and you will bring a range of advisors. Um, or, or the client will go around and seek out a range of advisors. They will end up with different, different outcomes, different advice and obviously and often different charges. And that's confusing and it's difficult and it's why they... They need, in the centre of that, they need a trusted advisor who can draw it all together. Um, and, 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 you know, that's, that's, um, I think that's still, still evolving and that people are still tra having to get to grips with that. May I ask a question? Is, do you think there's enough training of the wealth advisory industry, whether it's from lawyers through to wealth advisors, about how you go about becoming a trusted advisor? 
I, 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 would, I would tend to agree with the point that you made, that they are very specialist in their own area. And, and they believe that they're doing the very best for the client in their own area of expertise. But it's a question of finding the person who actually knows the full end-to-end -end needs of that client and how to achieve the best outcome for that client. It's difficult. Mm. Do, you think, do you think the term trusted advisor is the best term, though? I think, I think that trusted advisor implies that it's not a commercial relationship. I think if we, if we go beyond trusted advisor to talk about transparency in some, some way, um, then I think that would behove everybody very well. It would be we, a very... We don't call them trusted advisor. We have relationship managers. But uh, w w what we have created I is a group, which, which is called the key client group in BNP Paribas, where we have selected about 100 relationship managers in the world. So they are ranging everywhere in the world. <coughs> and we are training them, to, to answer your question, we are training them in order for them to be uh, very good, especially in knowing all what we can bring to our clients from BNP Paribas Group, because BNP Paribas is so huge. We have 200,000 people. We, we, we are doing nearly everything in finance. So we are training them, and we are giving them only a very short number of clients in order for them to focus and to have time as well to be educated, to then be able to answer the need of the client. Are they then trusted by the client? That's another question. But I think you're right not to call them trusted advisors, as you said, but relationship managers, because I think the, the, um, everyone's going to want to get paid. You know, if, they, if they have that level of expertise, they're going to want to get paid. The question is how they're paid. And are, are you paid um, on one level uh, a flat fee per annum to be a trusted advisor, and that's it? And so you're, you can't make money by having putting the client into hedge funds versus cash. You can't make money by s selling them products. Um, that, that's quite a good question for clients to ask. How actually do you get paid? And if you're getting paid because of products that you're coming forward with or different asset classes, different solutions, you, you could be absolutely excellent and professional, and I'm sure your, your employees are, but you're not a trusted advisor. You're someone there to make money out of the client. Nothing wrong with that, but it's, and as long as it's all transparent. So I, I think the key is to try to find probably not one trusted advisor, but a group of trusted advisors around these families who um, are not paid uh, by the solutions, but are paid for um, their expertise and knowledge and where to find I, I think the key to, I think the trusted advisor, no family can expect someone to give freely of their time for no cost. I think the thing is that what they want is transparency. Yeah. They want to know where you're making your money and they want to know what to expect. If you can anticipate their, what they need and provide a solution, they are really grateful and of course they'll pay you. But what they, do, what they don't want is nasty surprises. I would be inclined to, to agree um, on, on that, that um, we've recently been, been involved in a survey of a number of clients where uh, we were asking them about the recent changes to, to the way that fees are charged within, within our industry. <coughs> and they all absolutely acknowledge um, and understand that fees are charged within the industry. I think the challenge that we're seeing is with increased transparency is they're now demanding to understand where the value is. Yeah. So that's what they're really looking for. They really want to understand if, you know, they're happy to pay the fees and now they're very clear and transparent what those fees are, but they want to make sure that they're now getting value You've for You've really them. hit a good, good subject there about the value and you're hitting your point about, you know, the commercial nature and, and about the, the whole business about training for to become a trusted advisor, and I prefer the word trusted advisor. But the whole issue about seeing value, I mean, for example, a will, drafting a will. What is a will? A will is not something you pick up from WH Smith, counter, sign it, and, and away you go. A will is your entire estate, a lifetime's work, to be distributed amongst those you love at a time when you're not there. Now, that should be the most valuable thing. You must have the best advisor absolutely possible for that, it is not something you pay £250 for and you've done, you've, you've, you've done your probate. Uh, it, it's not, not like that. And I don't think people are really describing to their, to their uh, clients what the value is. 
if you get it wrong, litigation, especially family litigation, mm. is hugely expensive. Mm. And it must be avoided at all costs, I would say. I would actually say that this um, demonstration of value issue is something that's facing the whole, the whole investment management industry, right from mass affluent all the way through. Um, I think one of the things that perhaps the industry hasn't been so good at is demonstrating the parts of the value chain that get the client from where they are to the, the wealth solution that suits them. So it might be the case that they only see um, a split second investment decision as being something that's um, you know, something very time specific. But if you actually look at the, the plumbing behind that, all of the research, um, all of the other elements of their solution, custody, et cetera, et cetera, bringing that to mind and, and helping them to see all of the, the plumbing, as it were, is probably something that they need more awareness of. Mm. And that applies just as much to lawyers, doesn't it, Caroline? Mm. Mm -hmm. It certainly does, yeah. But, but what we find is with, with, with some professional advisors, so if we take, for example, lawyers or tax specialists who are creating a certain deal or a certain structure to achieve a good outcome for a client, you, there's a direct correlation between the fees that are paid and the improved position that the client finds themselves in. I think it's more difficult, as you say, across the broad breadth of the value chain. And <clears throat> one of the things some clients are saying is that um, there are bits where we charge fees and there are fees being charged where, where the clients see less value in them. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they're important. They've got to be done on, within the portfolio. So I think you're right. I think organisations need to look across their whole value chain and they've got to do a very good job of explaining what the value is that they're providing the client in those particular areas. That's that's playing out in technology, I think, particularly strongly. Um, as we know, technology has been hugely underinvested in, in wealth management for, for many, many years, and now um, it's finally kind of catching up. And I think a lot of that is driven by this need to be able to demonstrate very clearly and hopefully visually and digitally in, in, in lots of whizzy ways the value that you're delivering. So if you can do um, you know, back modelling and say, OK, we made this investment decision here and, and saved you you know, how many BPS here. That's a very clear demonstration of value, which I think helps when the, um, when the fee bill comes. Rather than a specific time basis. Yeah. So that um, moves away from RDR, doesn't it? Do we think that RDR is relevant to ultra high net worth clients or, or not? Is it applicable? Will it ever be applicable? Well, it's, it's applicable if they're, if they're not professional clients and if they're having an advisory service. Yeah, absolutely applicable. So, so uh, you, you, just because they're rich, it doesn't mean they're not uh, RDR doesn't apply. Is that is that right though? What do you think? Well, I mean, it, it's an interesting debate. I was just thinking about that, which is um, sometimes uh, organisations assume that because somebody has an awful lot of money, that that makes them a professional advisor, and that and that that isn't the that isn't the, mm. the, the, the or professional investor. That isn't the case. But uh, I, I think. I think um, you know organisations need to be very careful of the way they look at that. So, so fees are equally, you know, transparency and clarity and fairness of charges is equally applicable to uh, ultra high net worth clients as it is to all clients. There, there but a, sorry, there is a flip side to that though. Uh, although there are clients who are scrabbling around for comparison data and want to know where their provider is on a scale of expensive to cheap. There are also lots of very savvy ultra net worth individuals who um, are bringing purchasing power of the like of an institution to the table. Many times I've spoken to ultra net worth business heads and, and they've kind of um, been grumbling a little bit about the, the pressure that's put on them. They've got a big due diligence team, they've got you know many eyes on lots of different providers and they know exactly how much they should be paying for, for what they're getting and sometimes it's a little bit of a stretch I, I think. I think a good thing for the uh, ultra high net worth client, but less so for the institution, is actually um, we've seen in certain parts of, of, of the world uh, revenues coming under pressure and the UHNW clients are the ones who are leading that charge. They're pushing down on, um, they're demanding you know, greater discount on, on the fees that they're getting charged. Um, and where they don't see value in investing, they'll be putting money in, in, in uh, they'll be holding it in cash and putting yeah. in other things and that's impacting what fees. What we're seeing is, is that a lot of clients are, are beginning to, uh, a lot of wealth advisors are beginning to begin to pick their clients in the sense that where you've got a client that's putting so much pressure on the fees that the, the institution or the, or the advisor is not making any money out of it, mm -hmm. they're beginning to say, I don't really want to do business with this person anymore because they've got to, 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 to make money for their, for their organisation as well. 
So I'm beginning to see a lot more wealth advisors that are actually picking their clients. And a client can go so far in terms of putting pressure on the organization, but they want, they want good quality advice. They've got to agree that they have to pay for it. And I think we're going to see a lot more wealth advisors picking their clients. I mean, I'm sure that you, to a certain extent, don't take on every single client. That, that could be a big difference between the, the private wealth advisor and, and banks, because uh, for us, uh, uh, I would say for a private advisor, uh, when a client has only deposits, it's uh, not uh, profitable for, for the advisor. Uh, for the banks, uh, uh, we uh, need liquidity, as you know. Mm -hmm. uh, there is strong pressure on liquidity from all the regulators. So we are valuing a lot those type of clients who have only deposits and who are not uh, buying a hedge fund one day, private equity fund another, etc. So uh, uh, for us, uh, what we look at is really uh, at uh, either deposits or credits because we also like to, to, to make credits. On credits, we hope to make money. We have risk, so we have to, to, to wait uh, the return with the risk. But so I think our approach is quite different because uh, of these liquidity constraints following the crisis of 2008. It has dramatically changed the way we are considering deposits. Before, deposits were useless, I may say. Now, deposits are liquidity provider, and that's very important for banks like us. And is that more so in, in Asia and the CIS, it's for instance? Everywhere. It's, it's everywhere, everywhere with the regulatory framework. But, yeah. but, I mean, but could, I ask, yes, could I ask, is that, would that lead you to, mm. to offer your investment management service at a lower, at a, at a break even or, or loss making because you're so keen to get deposit? Uh, absolutely, we, we are taking into account uh, the benefits of the liquidity mm -hmm. that we are somewhere crediting to the client. So even if we lose on the other hand because the client is not active enough and we still have to maintain all the services we are bringing to the client, as we value the liquidity component, then we can be break even or even better. So mm -hmm. Is that a sustainable business model though? Uh, as long as the regulators will ask uh, the <coughs> banks to be more liquid than before, Helicopter. yes. <laughs> What do you think about that, William? Well, I think it's, it's very interesting to learn that. But uh, the, the other point I was going to make was, was that, um, unfortunately, in investment management, you can't, when you're talking about added value, you don't know what the added value is. I think the nub of this discussion is all around business models for the ultra-high net worths. Can we just have a quick discussion about that? Remy, what's your view about the best business model for the ultra-high net worth person? I don't know if it's the best, I, I think so, but uh, I can describe what we offer to ultra high networks at uh, BNP Paribas. We have this dedicated group, key client group, and uh, we offer to our clients the best of all the bank. And uh, as I said before, we are a very big group, international in more than 100 countries. We have very strong retail banking, corporate banking, investment banking, asset management, real estate, you name it. Corporate finance is very important for entrepreneurs because we can go along them uh, and the trust is there because we are managing jointly their corporate event and their wealth. So this is the model we are proposing to our clients. We have also lots of resources to devote to, to them. Uh, typically on philanthropy, we, we, we have been active for 10 years just to help them to figure out how they can give back, never advising them who they should give back to, but how to do it. Other examples, typically, we, we have a team which is dedicated to vineyards because we know they, they all like uh, wine and vineyards. Uh, we, I mentioned about the credit. It could be for their own passion. We have a team de de dedicated to art advisory, so all the passion in order for them also to forget sometimes what is a pure financial, which could be boring, but also to accompany them on their passion. So it's an overall uh, service that you have Absolutely. for your clients. William, I, I guess yours is a very different model. Would you like to uh, elaborate well, on I'd that? I'd like to start in a different place, which, which is the fact that most of these families will, have, will want to set up some form of family office. It might be a very simple family office that's helping travel and uh, insurance, uh, or it might be a very sophisticated family office with a uh, hundred people managing their investments. 
So to me, the, the thing starts with what kind of family office should I, as a family, set up? How much should I do inside? It's a buy or build thing. How much should I do inside? How much should I externalize? Um, the use of a, a very sophisticated private banking service is vital for these families. But the, the thing about a family office, it gives you control, uh, privacy, and cost, cost savings. Those are the three real reasons why people set up family, and philanthropy probably as well. And that's the heart of it. So the service we provide at Lord North Street is, is merely an outsourced part small part of what goes on in a family office. It's not for everyone. But for those families that want to have a, family, a private office, but they don't want to hire all the staff internally to run it, and they don't want to put all their money with one or more banks, then it's a, it's a, it's a service that works well. Well, we're finding with um, the family office members of, of Family Beehive that they want to meet and find out what the options are. Yeah. And what the, the good thing, the best part of a one-stop shop or indeed a, a, a boutique investment manager in a multi-family office, what they want is to be empowered to make their own decisions. What they worry about in terms of a large bank is that once you're in the door, you're going to get product push from other areas. You're not going to get a variety of different solutions. And that's slightly a worry to them. But we are seeing a massive trend towards wanting them to meet uh, and come together. I mean, we've got 12, 15 family offices in London at the moment, all wanting to meet in a quiet and private uh, setting where they can talk openly with each other. Dan, business models, what do you think? Um, I, I think we talked about earlier, we talked about the customers, and um, you phrased it as for ultra high net worth, is, is there a business model? I, I would turn, turn it on its head a bit and say, there are lots and lots of different customers with lots and lots of different needs. And there is also quite a broad industry out there serving those clients. So I think the important thing is to focus on the things that the client wants and looks for and values in their relationship. So we've heard a lot that um, the very important thing for clients is that they've got a, a relationship. They've got a relationship with, the, uh, with their financial advisor, one that's trusted and one that can access all the services and range of services that they need. And there are going to be very different clients who source their wealth from different areas and they've got different backgrounds and different objectives. And I think it would be difficult to say that there's one business model that will satisfy all of those customers. I think the important thing for, for industries is to really understand the customers that they serve mm -hmm. and serve them in, in the best way that they possibly can to meet their needs. And what's really important is that you understand those clients, you understand their needs and objectives and you deliver on your promise to them. Wendy, you write about this a lot. What do you think about uh, business I think, models? Um, to, to echo Dan's point, you need to take a very careful look at the, the client segment that you have and, and that you want to have to work out what they want. Um, wealth management is a very broad church, um, particularly at the ultra high net worth end. Um, clients may want a very niche provider that can, that's aiming for outperformance in one specific investment area. On the other hand, they might be looking for a global banking brand that can provide support in areas like getting their children into good universities, and those are you know, wildly different at two ends of the spectrum. But I think probably one of the most important issues for banks or wealth managers themselves is what, how far they want to go down that road. Um, I don't think we should kid ourselves about how expensive it is to have a philanthropy offering, um, an art advisory offering, all of those, the yacht financing, all of those kinds of things. And, and having the heft to do that might mean that you aren't necessarily delivering the alpha that they might want as an ultra net worth. Okay. What I'd like to do now is just to sum up and, and give everybody an opportunity to say what, what is the most important thing for them that's come out of today's discussion. I'd like to start with Irene. Thank you. you. I mean, well, I think we've, we've said it just in the last few minutes here about the customer is king, and it will be. The models that evolve, how the landscape evolves, how service provision evolves for high net worth individuals, I think will be driven by what the customer need is and what those trends are. And we must also not ignore, and we've not touched on it that much, what technology will drive in that space as well. So I think um, how that combination of customer need, younger generations coming through, um, the views on what the younger generations of the families also are looking for and how technology combines in that could make this quite an interesting landscape as we move forward into the next uh, number of years. Thank you, Wendy. 
Um, I think one of the most important things to come out is the is the preference towards private equity. Study after study shows that over the next 30 years, ultra net worth families are looking to private equity. Perhaps it's where they made their own wealth and where they feel comfortable. But I think we also have to bear in mind that 70% of businesses fail in the startup stage. So the need for expertise, the need for specific expert solutions rather than product push, I think is something that's going to play out a lot further. Thank you, Remy. I would like to follow up on the, what uh, Ayun said about the next generation and the changes uh, it will imply. Uh, in BNP Paribas Wealth Management, uh, every year we have what we call the NetGen offsite, where we invite the uh, uh, kids of our clients, the kids or uh, someone elder, uh, uh, because uh, the range is usually between 20 and 30 years old. Uh, and we speak with them, we teach them, it's uh, fully educational, uh, we have uh, 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 off-sites in France, in Asia, in Brazil, uh, soon in the Middle East. So we know what they are expecting from us, and it's true that technology is key and digital is key. And uh, being in a retail bank, it's not a product, it is a real advantage because you know it's in retail that uh, the digital is more advanced for customers than in other, any other areas because when you have to deal with millions of clients, you need to be very, very uh, smart and efficient. So what we are doing currently is to leverage what has been developed for retail mm. in terms of techniques to propose it to wealth management clients and especially to the young generation. Mm. Caroline, what's your one point, your one big point? Oh, I was going to say the top three, so I'll reduce it down to one. Uh, family offices want to meet each other. They want to feel empowered, taking up on, on Irene's point. Uh, they want to, to, to feel that their, their advisors care for them. Uh, so I think the main thing is family offices want to learn from each other. They want to meet. They want to have advisors that really care for them. And I think what we're going to see over the next few months is the person who can actually care for the client is going to be king. Thank you. William, your killer point. Well, I would, turn it, I would turn it back to the client for, with a plea to the clients, and, and that is please, please think really hard before engaging with advisors on what you want to achieve. What, what is, if you could write down a piece of paper, if you go back forward 25 years, what would be success from now? Because that varies enormously with different families, and it's much easier for advisors to advise if someone comes in with a, with a very clear vision of what success is. Dan, you've got the uh, responsibility of summing the whole thing up. So I think I would just, um, I, 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 would, I would turn it back on the uh, wealth managers, the family offices and the private banks and say, uh, we've been through a significant period of, of change and adjustment. Uh, we're looking for a huge amount of, we're seeing a huge amount of growth coming out of the UHNW segment over the next two or three years. And I think it's time for organisations to be able to balance um, what has been a, a strong and tough regulatory agenda over the last few years and, and make sure that they're really focused on the customer, making sure the customer understands, they understand what the customer is looking for and that they can gear their offer towards what that customer needs. Brilliant. OK. Well, it just remains for me to say thank you very much indeed to all of you uh, for coming today. It's been a fascinating discussion. I've learned a lot. It's been brilliant. So thank you to Irene Graham, Wendy Spires, Remy Frank, Caroline Garnham, William Drake and Dan Dagg. Thank you all very much indeed for coming and thank you also for BNP Paribas for hosting this event with Wealth Briefing. Thank you very much.